Show and I thought I'd kick the new year off uh, with what this channel is known for and that is of course in-depth uh, unsponsored independent reviews and why not start with an absolute gorgeous creature we are of course talking about this uh, Grand Seiko here that I unboxed uh, last year I gave my initial impressions and a month has gone past uh, which has given me time to write about it experience it and there's quite some surprising negatives um, and some new positives as well. Now, before I get into this, I'll do a quick wristwatch check wearing the Fortis. There it is. On, incidentally, I actually got this strap for my sub, but uh, I think it works on the Tooltastic Fortis Cosmonaut, especially as uh, next month, hopefully, I get to review the new Marine Master, which I'm really, really excited about. But I love this combo. Uh, I think it gives it a really kind of Tooltastic military-esque vibe with uh, this fantastic rubber straps. I'm really impressed with the new straps from Risk County Watch Club. They've really hit it out of the park in terms of quality, price, and of course the fit and feel. But we're not talking about straps, we are of course talking about this uh, enthralling creation, this capo lavoro. Um, so where else better to start than with some history to contextualize this piece? Grand Seiko started its history in 1960, as Seiko wanted to compete with their Swiss rivals, not just on the affordable level, but something more refined. By this time, Japan was already fast becoming a world-renowned powerhouse of manufacturing. And this is not the first time Seiko produced high-quality watches. Previously, and most notably, the Lord Marvel, Seiko Crown and Seiko Kronos. But with all these watches, they still found it very difficult to penetrate markets beyond their own domestic dominance. And therefore, Seiko would set up two divisions within their own company that would compete internally to come up with the best watches they possibly could. This was, of course, the Daini Seiko Sha and Sua Seiko Sha watch factories. The former was selected for the initial Grand Seiko project, but both would eventually contribute to the line. For the next decade, these competing firms would create dozens of mechanical watches in a fierce battle to outdo each other year by year, with even more accurate and increasingly higher quality automatic and manual wind models. They would even compete in various Swiss chronometer trials, eventually beating all the competitors and thus proving a Japanese watch brand could produce watches just as well, if not better, than the renowned illustrious Swiss counterparts. However, once Seiko introduced the world-changing quartz technology in 1969, afterwards demand naturally waned, and so the Grand Seiko line was retired in 1976, only to be revived a decade later by introducing the first quartz Grand Seiko in 1988. And once mechanical watches finally regained market share, Seiko responded by relaunching Grand Seiko in 1998. By this time, Seiko had a new trick up its sleeve. Grand Seiko would now be powered by a new revolutionary super accurate movement that they had been developing since the 1960s, a culmination and hybrid of several innovative technologies. We are of course talking about spring drive. Diameter is 39, which is shy of 39 millimeters. Of course, we've got a really slender 10.2 millimeters, and that's because it is a manual wind movement, of course. Lug to lug, we're looking at 43.2, and then a very annoying <laughs> 19 millimeters. Yeah, you can already see that is one of the first negatives. Can't stand uh, odd number straps. But I have to say, the strap, uh, it comes on uh, this wonderful crocodile. 
uh, leather is really, really good. So you probably won't swap it out. But anyway, um, talking of materials, we have entirely stainless steel with um, a brushed sides there and then that uh, Zarozatsu polishing, which we're going to have to talk about. Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a negative I found, but uh, more on that later. We got a curved sapphire crystal with AR coating on the inside. And it's beautifully framed with that lovely smooth uh, stepped bezel there. In terms of fit and feel, well, it wears incredibly well. Uh, very dress watch. Also, the curves of it just make the uh, the whole thing cuff friendly. And of course, perfect uh, because it's you've got this clean time only, very symmetrical, classic dress watch aesthetic. You do get a lot of dial though. I mean, look at that expansive dial. Of course, no luminescence because uh, this is uh, a dress watch. In terms of accuracy, well, you've got that plus one and we'll get into the movement. In fact, I'm gonna do the movement entirely in its own uh, section, uh, but I will say that it is hackable. Um, if you didn't see the unboxing, uh, it has one of the most buttery smooth, uh, very satisfying manual winds uh, actions I've ever experienced. It feels incredibly refined. First introduced in 2019, this relatively new 9R31 caliber is the product of over 20 years of pioneering watchmaking. For those new to spring drive, a quick summation. It's basically a hybrid of traditional mechanics mixed with a method of timekeeping using a rotating disc between electromagnets. This concept differs greatly from all other earlier watch technologies like mechanical, electronic and quartz as the gear train is in constant motion. Unlike a traditional escapement with its stop-start impulses or intermittent movements like quartz. What enables spring drive to achieve this is the tri-synchro regulator that manages the energy of the main spring along with electrical energy and electromagnetic energy to control the glide wheel. The result is a feedback loop at a constant and ideal speed of motion that never deviates more or less than one second a day, thus allowing precise timing. This technology started development in the 1970s but it was not until 1999 that it was introduced and ready to be unleashed on the market. Completely proprietary manufactured, this form of timekeeping technology is unique to Seiko. So what makes this caliber superior of its predecessors? Well, the 9R31 also boasts a further innovation of having a clever dual spring barrel system that contains two main springs set in parallel therefore able to deliver a highly impressive power reserve of 72 hours, which is of course three days. And astonishingly, it manages to do this while still being relatively slender in scale. As with any high-end caliber, it's completed with beautiful beveling, contrasting finishes, thermally blued screws, and all the rest of it. So I'm just gonna interrupt there uh, and remind you to like this video uh, if you wanna see more free reviews like this the best way to support the channel is just to leave a like compared to most grand seikos we've featured on the channel over the years this sbgy 007 is perhaps the most faithful to the original design language or design grammar as seiko likes to call it this is a set of guidelines set during the formative late 60s as Grand Seiko established itself and was set by Seiko's very first watch designer, Taro Tanaka. This design language, a series of nine characteristics, can be seen in the shapes used, from the curves of the lugs to the angular tips, the multifaceted tapering plied hour markers, and of course the now iconic razor-sharp blade-like handset. Tanaka's signature Grand Seiko style would first be implemented with the 1967 Grand Seiko 44GS, which is now regarded as one of the most famous designs of this classic Seiko era, and you can unequivocally also see it in the watch we are looking at today. However, there are two main differences that elevate this from the watch's ancestors, as well as the rather stringent nine rules. Firstly, and most obviously, is the dial that gives the watch its name, Omiwatari. 
To understand this mesmerizing feature, we have to understand Japanese classical art as a whole. If we look at any of Japan's most important artwork, you will see elements of nature being the most dominant feature. Mankind often being represented as either diminutive in scale or sometimes just secondary to the landscape and weather. Works by Hukusei and Hiroshige in particular demonstrate this most famously. A tradition in Japanese art deeply rooted in Buddhism and even centuries before the religion, as far back as their ancient art. You can see the proliferation of nature as an inspiration in almost everything, from their feudal architecture to porcelain, lacquerware, paintings, textiles, sculptures, you name it. So of course it was only logical that it would permeate into their watch design too. The specially created texture of the dial is inspired by the water of Lake Suwa, near the factory we mentioned earlier, that freezes over and most years a long ridge appears in the ice from one side of the lake to the other. Legend has it that this is where the gods walk out of the ice, known as Omi Otari. The finished effect the Grand Seiko craftsmen have come up with is a unique colour that subtly changes as you move it in different light. It's a sumptuous effect, while understated, is still captivating, changing from an arctic blue to a pearl white, with a few more colours in between, with ridges and snow dunes that look like it was formed by a wind, but on a miniaturised scale. In order to finish the watch, Grand Seiko employs a team of craftsmen to polish all the surfaces of the hands, indices and case to an ultra-distortion-free, brilliant mirrored finish known as Zarozatsu polishing. Named after the European company that used to make the polishing machines, it was first introduced at both Seiko factories with the legendary 44GS in 1967 and the 61GS released the following year. To complement and accentuate the very slight hues of blue found in the dial, we see a royal blue stitching on the luxurious black crocodile leather strap with the three-fold clasp and push-button release. So let's talk about negatives. Well, it's only according to the website splash proof, uh, which is never a good sign. Basically, it's 30 meters. I had to do a little bit of additional research to actually find that out. I can't stand it when websites are, you know, surreptitious and not precise about the specifications. You go to the website, you want to read what exactly it does. Um, so I do not appreciate when uh, brands kind of, you know, try and, you know, use wordplay. Basically, it's a very low water resistance. Personally, I would love it to be like the uh, the Saab 033, no screw down and it's still uh, 100 meters. So if they can do it on this, why not at this higher level? I think a bit of a corner cut, 30 meters for a dress watch. Yeah, sure, fine. But you know, for an everyday watch, a little bit worrying. So for me, the biggest disappointment is actually one of its best features. And that is the finishing, the Zaruzatsu finishing. It is an extremely high distortion free mirror finish and it can only be done in Japan by their specialists. And I was warned by Moya who have so graciously lent this in to be extremely careful with it because any refinishing, they have to send it back. Uh, they just can't do it even though they have their fantastic experts and which makes me worried uh, to, to kind of to try it out. If I had pulled the trigger and this was mine, I wouldn't worry so much. But, you know, this is due to the specially tempered steel and also these um, these craftsmen, which, you know, it, it takes immense skill and you have to have the right machines to achieve it. So the next uh, negative, and there's quite a few, I'm quite surprised at this actually, uh, and forgive me, I'm going to be a bit vulgar and talk about money, but it is the value. It's the big elephant in the room. A lot of people will have an issue paying almost nine grand for this watch. But think of it this way. If this was a Vacheron Constantin or an AP or an Lang A or something of that nature and not GS on the dial, you'd be paying between 10 and 20. Whereas here it's uh, just shy of 9,000. So you know, it's it's that eternal discussion. Nobody would bat an eyelid with uh, those brands. But again, you know, that's that age-old um, discussion that uh, will rage on until uh, GS 
I'm going to start calling them GS, has, you know, to differentiate them, has, um, you know, the, the perception has changed about the brand. Unfortunately, I don't feel it has. Outside of Japan, its high-end pieces don't get the recognition and respect they deserve, um, despite some incredible new stuff coming out in the last few years. Bear in mind, do you know what it takes to, and I've been in about seven different watch factories, do you know what it takes to make a watch to this level? Uh, all completely proprietary made, few can do it, few can do it worldwide. Anyway, um, personally I would have liked to see a little bit more skeletonization on that bridge there to expose the uh, inner workings. Um, if you're paying all that money, I want to see more. Let's, let's show off that amazing technology. There is, and I think it's, uh, which one is it? I think it's the 9R02 has the skeletonized barrel. Why not on this one, you know? Uh, what else? The dial space. Well, you know, I have to say, it's amazing what a few millimeters can do. I would have liked it to be the scale of the Saab. Uh, then I would probably pull the trigger. Let's just compare it to a uh, Vintage Seamaster. I'm very much in, into my classic 38, 4, 35, 36 millimeter sizes for dress watches. If you've seen my AP I wear at Christmas, just think it could be a smidgen smaller. So last negative, and this was really surprising. You see the crown is pulled out. There is a ghost position. I can't work out if this is a specific reason or just because as far as I know, this wasn't adapted from a, um, a date caliber, maybe it was. So you've heard of the ghost date, where much cheaper watches, they simply just hide the date or the date wheel with the dial. And here, there's no, <laughs> there's no reason to do that. Um, it just feels a little unrefined. Maybe I'm missing a trig or there's some reason behind it, but uh, it should just have two positions. Winding in and all the way out. Uh, like that, but three, it's nonsensical and it's kind of a, um, you know, you expect for, for this kind of horology stuff not to see that. Very surprising. If anybody knows why, or perhaps I have a, a faulty model here, God knows. Its slender shape reminds me very much of the Gerald Genta designed and now largely forgotten White Shadow by Universal Genève. It shares the same mid-century elegance, uncluttered, clean simplicity, and above all, slenderness. The White Shadow achieved its modest height by utilizing a micro rotor, whereas here we get something equally as horologically important with spring drive. The biggest positive will be the shifting of the power reserve, typically offset, on the front of most Grand Seikos and placed more fittingly on the back. Not only improves the aesthetics, but it actually makes total sense. As we all know, it's harmful to wind a watch on the wrist, so when you are topping it up, it will most likely be in your hand and therefore visible. For those who truly know horology beyond the tiny part of it that is watches, you undoubtedly know why it was offset. This aesthetic goes back to pocket watches and before the miniaturization of components would allow for a more symmetrical alignment. A style that almost everyone has adopted to give off a more classical look. Breguet certainly does it the best with their dress watches. As you saw in my unboxing, many were delighted with the best of both worlds solution. In a world where luxury watches are still dominated by gaudy, oversized Richard Millais and brash, blinged out rollies and APs, it's refreshing to see something so tasteful, sophisticated and low key, but still with the right amount of panache, especially in a more realistic size. This is a true luxury watch for a more refined palette, shall we say. Somebody that appreciates horology at a more profound level, far beyond its meaning that has been kind of hijacked by marketing and is often misunderstood by watch enthusiasts who couldn't tell you what a Tompion clock is or an astrolabe, but somehow still call themselves into horology. Grand Seiko outside of Japan will always suffer from the stigma of being associated with its more affordable options from the parent company. In my opinion, I really do feel if they had just dropped the last two words from the branding and simply had the Gothic style GS, as you see applied to the dial, maybe, problem solved. But I highly doubt they will ever do this, as back in Japan, they are still extremely proud 
of those two words. But despite the eternal branding problem, for those in the know and those who value what it really means to make a watch to this level of quality, along with its technical proficiency, amazing technology, and let's not forget, all entirely in-house made, this is certainly a winner. It feels like a congruent and logical step in the right direction that honors the brand's legacy, cultural traditions, but simultaneously still offers something new and unlike everything else out there, without having to resort to being loud, obnoxious, or in just bad taste. So will I pull the trigger? Is this the Grand Seiko I've been waiting for? Truthfully, I haven't had that powerful, you know, instant fall in love kind of factor with this piece. Uh, is it the one of my favorite GSs yet? Absolutely, I think it's cracking. I, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful watch. Um, but right now, you know, I'm still in my 36 millimeter phase, my Laurier Safari, Explorer, Date Justs. What can I say? Uh, I am still ensorcelled by it. It is absolutely pure class. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, let me know your thoughts, queries, comments, opinions, all the rest of it down below. What do you feel uh, and think about this piece? Um, where would you like to see Grand Seiko going next? Uh, I'd definitely like to hear that. Oh, and don't forget to like this video, especially if you want to see more free uh, reviews like this. Uh, onwards and upwards. Thank you for watching, and I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.